Let's bring in an experienced venture capitalist for some perspective on this. Scott Sandell is a general partner at New Enterprise Associates, which happens to be the largest institutional investor in Groupon. He led NEA's investment in Fusion IO, the Salt Lake City server storage company that went public earlier this month. He sits on the board of Bloom Energy and invested in Fisker. Welcome back to Bloomberg West. Thank you. So, I know you can't say a lot about Groupon because of SEC's regulations and you're, te you're technically in a quiet period, but you guys are the largest institutional investor in Groupon. Since they filed to go public, this has become one of the most polarizing topics in Silicon Valley. I mean, we had Vivek Wadwa on yesterday who called it a Ponzi scheme. Um, how can you weigh in on this? Well, unfortunately, I can't weigh in very much at all. Yeah. And, and that's sort of an... Uh, it, to me calls into question whether we should have quiet periods because if you think about the purpose of a quiet period it's to protect the company from over promoting itself to the, sh the future shareholders but in this case the company is in no position to defend itself and there's all this debate raging around which I think stands a chance of actually tilting the balance uh, inappropriately by the time it actually goes public. What kind of changes do you think there should be in SEC regulations? I think if there's a quiet period, it should be a lot shorter. I think the company should be able to say more in response to questions that are posed to it. As it is, I'm able to say almost nothing. So what can you say? Can you say anything about the competition? Living Social has also filed to go public. It seems they're trying to beat each other to the punch. Well, to be clear, Emily, I'm not the board member at Groupon. My partner, Peter Barris, is. So relative to the general public, I'm probably less experienced in knowing all the details of these two businesses since they're so carefully studied by seemingly everyone today. OK, so how would you describe the environment that we're in right now, where we're seeing you know, company after company file to go public, some of them without profits. Uh, yeah. Does it seem to be a bubble-like environment to you? There are some characteristics of a bubble, but I remember back to the last tech bubble, and I think there are really material differences. I mean, as one of your earlier commentators said, you know, both Living Social and Groupon are, are relatively large companies with significant revenues, revenues that in earlier eras would have allowed them to go public, you know, a year or two ago. And if you look back at the kinds of companies that went public in 1999 and 2000, we had companies that had no revenues at all, getting, you know, maybe not $20 billion valuations, but hundreds of millions of dollars or billion dollar valuations. Even some of the companies that turned out to be really great companies, companies like eBay and Yahoo and ultimately Google went public. Uh, well, Google's not a, a good case because it went public later, but the earlier ones, uh, many of them went public very prematurely. They ended up turning out okay, but as you remember, many of them, you know, the stock prices went down for a while when the bubble collapsed and they ultimately came back, the ones that were to survive. So I think uh, when you compare it to that period, it doesn't feel to me nearly as much like a bubble. I also think that there's a difference between the companies that you're reporting on, which are, you know, the really spectacular leadership companies, you were talking about Zynga earlier, or Twitter, or Facebook, any of these companies, and the really early stage companies that we fund. That's where I see a little bit more uh, the characteristics of a bubble. It's one thing to pay up for a company which is doing extraordinarily well, which has established itself in the marketplace. Maybe it isn't profitable, but you can see a path to profitability. It's another thing to pay a very high valuation, 100, 200 million dollars for a company that's just getting started. That's where I think and the danger zone that is. With, for example, Square just getting 100 million dollars, uh, its valuation quadrupling in the last six months. Yeah, from something like 200 million to a billion six. I mean, I haven't had an opportunity to look at the company, so maybe there's something there I don't see, but that seems a little rich to me. All right, I want to bring in Corey Johnson. Uh, he was also talking earlier about the difference in the bubble between then and now. Corey, go ahead. Well, what we saw then, I mean, I want to get back to this quiet period discussion. The quiet period, you said it's to protect a company from promoting itself. No, it's to protect investors from promotional companies. Uh, it doesn't seem like that's a bad thing. Well, of course, it isn't a bad thing when you say it that way, Corey, but the reality is when you have the entire world, you know, uh, defaming the, the company in question here and the company can't even respond to simple questions that might be, you know, easily set the facts straight, well, I think the it's a little out the of company's balance. Case, 
the company's case is made in the S-1 filing. That's the whole point. It's a, it's a dispassionate display of what the company does. They get to write the document. They get to put all the words they want in there, and the financials should speak for themselves. I mean, we've seen so much stock fraud. We see it all the time. We see it with these, these Chinese reverse mergers blowing up left and right. It seems that it's a good thing to have companies not promoting these stocks. You've already got so much effort uh, and strength behind the companies and the banks trying to get these things out. It seems like the companies not being able to promote themselves beyond that is a good thing to protect investors. Well, Corey, it's just like any investment decision. It's not a decision. We don't make investment decisions uh, based simply on reading a business plan. We like to sit down and talk to the management team and ask them questions that might arise from having read the business plan. I think it's the same kind of discussion that investors should expect to have as they're preparing to uh, decide on a public offering whether they want to invest in its shares. Now, in the case of Fusion IO, you guys uh, didn't get anywhere near the kind of attention that uh, the Groupon deal is getting, but that's actually worked out quite successfully for, for shareholders that got in. But it's an intriguing company, not least of which because it has really just two customers, uh, Apple and, and Facebook, um, without getting the technicalities of how the business works. How do you look at that business with just two main customers representing over 80 percent of revenues? Well, I, I don't think they represent over 80% of revenues, and they actually have thousands of customers, many household names. Uh, they do have two significant customers, for sure, and that's, uh, that's, of course, a risk for any business that has a concentration of customers like that. There's no denying it. I want to talk to you a little bit about your role with the NVCA. Um, we've been looking at how the venture industry has been contracting uh, from $103 billion in 2000 to $11.6 billion last year. How do you see this playing out? Well, I actually think we're setting, the industry is set up now going forward for say the next five to ten years in a way that will actually produce, I think, very favorable returns for limited partners. The reason that limited partners have abandoned the asset class is that returns have been uh, almost dismal for the last decade and only a small number of firms have eked out the sort of profits that have kept their investors continuing to support them. So. Uh, if you go back 10 years, I said it was $103 billion raised in 2000. Four years before that, when I joined the industry in 1996, $10 billion was raised. So it went from 10 to 103 in four years, which I think was you know, a vast oversupply of capital, and it didn't correct itself until just the last part of this past decade. And one thing you think investors should be looking at more closely is clean tech, which a number of venture capitalists have shunned. Why clean tech? Well, if you look at the amount of innovation and where we are in the cost curves for things like photovoltaics, you know, they've, they've been too expensive relative to tra traditional sources of energy. But in the next two or three years, maybe four years, we're approaching the point where solar energy will be cheaper than coal-fired power plants and other so traditional sources of dirty energy, if you will. When that happens, I think the, the demand for these products will soar. It's been growing rapidly as it is, but I think it will become a much, much larger industry. And as it does, there will be a huge opportunity for job creation. We in this country have created many of the innovations that have led to those uh, you know, cost curve reductions. And yet today we see primarily uh, sources of funding and companies in Asia coming in and buying up the assets of these American innovative companies and taking the jobs offshore. China has definitely taken a big interest in clean tech. All right, Scott Sandell of NEA, great to have you back here on Bloomberg West, and thanks for your thoughts. Thank you, Emily. All right.